we're, we're feeling very graced this evening uh, to have with us a man who in, in his 33 years in the U.S. Foreign Service compiled one of the most impressive records of any career diplomat. Bill Burns worked under five presidents, served as ambassador to Jordan and Russia, was an assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern Affairs and an undersecretary for, for, uh, for political affairs. Plus, he was only the second serving career diplomat in history to become a deputy secretary of state. Not bad for an army brat who was born at Fort Bragg into an uh, itinerant military family that bounced from post to post with a dozen moves and three high schools by the time Bill was 17. His diplomatic career spanned from Reagan to Obama, uh, who uh, incidentally got him to stay on uh, past when he had intended to leave. Uh, and his areas of greatest specialty involved a couple of the world's most challenging locales, the Middle East and Russia. His memoir, which draws on newly declassified material, provides an inside look at American diplomacy from the end of the Cold War and Madrid Peace Conference to the Iraq War, the Arab Spring, the Iran nuclear deal, and Russia's reemergence as a global power player. Bill was in the Situation Room when Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden, and he flew from Benghazi back to Washington with the remains of Ambassador Chris Stevens. On multiple occasions, he met with Vladimir Putin, and he led the American team to Oman that engaged in secret back-channel talks with Iran on the nuclear issue. These are just a few of the noteworthy moments from Bill's exemplary career. <coughs> he retired from the Foreign Service in 2014 and these days presides over the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. In his book, he conveys the art and science of statecraft in revealing detail, and by doing so makes a powerful argument for why diplomacy still matters. His own life story stands as a timely reminder of what can be achieved through the application of quiet power. It also shows what's required, a sense of history, strategic insight, good judgment, intelligence, dedication, and diligence, all traits that Bill put to work. A review in the New York Journal of Books said Bill's memoir, quote, it is much like the author himself, thorough, measured, articulate, and above all, diplomatic. <laughs> now, Bill will be in conversation with Evan Osnos, an accomplished journalist experienced in both foreign and domestic affairs. Evan first reported abroad for the Chicago Tribune in the Middle East, then moved to China, switching while there to The New Yorker. His eight years in China led to a great book, Age of Ambition, which won the National Book Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer. Uh, for the past five years, Evan has been based here in D.C., covering politics and foreign affairs as, as staff writer for The New Yorker. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming both Bill Burns and Evan Osnos. Well, when, uh, when they ask you to interview Bill Burns about diplomacy, it's like interviewing Elvis about the guitar. <laughs> and um, as some of you know, I think a lot of you know, uh, Bill has, as you see tonight, a fan club in the world of foreign affairs. And he has a fan club not only for the reasons uh, that... Brad described his pattern of achievement, the depth and range of his experience, but also for the decency with which he has conducted it. And I think uh, the measure of that is a number of people who are here tonight who have worked with him, uh, some people who have covered him, um, some people he may have worked for, um, but we are grateful for your presence here tonight. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to... Uh, mention just a word or two that you may not have heard about Bill's record of experience because, <clears throat> as you know, his book is an eloquent argument for the power of diplomacy. It's also an analysis of the places he knows very well, Middle East, Russia, Washington. Um, but the thing you don't yet know, because you haven't had a chance to read the book yet, and I have, 
is that it is full of delicious detail. It is full of the kinds of detail uh, like the day that a young foreign service officer named Bill Burns walked into the office of Deputy Secretary of State John Whitehead, who happened to have a priceless art collection, and Bill, in a moment of triumph, knocked a Degas ballerina off the desk onto the floor, and mercifully it was carpeted, his career continued, and history <laughs> marches on. When Bill um, finally was allowed to retire after threatening and pleading, uh, the president had stopped it, John Kerry had stopped it, and when he finally was allowed, I just think it's worth mentioning, Secretary Kerry compared Bill to George Kennan and Chip Boland, said he was an American diplomatic legend. President Obama hailed him as the consummate diplomat and an inspiration to generations of public service. And indeed, that is the case. Please join me in welcoming Bill Burns tonight. <laughs> But we're going to get to the topics of the day, the regions, um, troubles here and abroad. But before we do, one of the things that is most interesting about this book is that you describe the mechanics and the power of diplomacy, how it actually works. You have at one point a line where you say, it is by nature an unheroic, quiet endeavor, less swaggering than unrelenting. Can you give us a story or two about what you mean? Sure, and I'd be glad to. And Evan, I, I, it's great to be with you. And Brad and Lisa, thanks so much for doing this at Politics and Prose. And thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I set the opening scene of the book quite deliberately in the George H.W. Bush administration when I worked for Secretary of State James Baker. Um, and it's a scene that's at the Madrid Peace Conference in the fall of 1991. And as some of you may remember, this was the conference which for the first time brought the Israelis, Palestinians, the Arab states uh, together in the same room around the same negotiating framework. And I mention that because it was the moment when I really did see American power and diplomacy at their peak. But it also helped underscore for me the difference between swagger uh, and, you know, the kind of triumphalist rhetoric and chest beating that you associate with that, which tends to work better in domestic politics than it does in foreign policy. And what Bush and Baker embodied, at least in my experience, which was the head down, unrelenting, hard nosed, mostly private approach to advancing America's uh, interests in the world. Um, you know, their diplomacy was not about spiking the football on top of the Berlin Wall at the end of the Cold War. Um, it was about applying American power um, with skill and persistence. And the persistence part is important because, you know, Baker, and I was a junior diplomat working for him at the time, made nine trips to the Middle East between March 1991 and November 1991 when the Madrid Peace Conference took place. Um, and it was a demonstration of his willpower and his skill and his persistence as much as anything else. He's got a wall uh, outside his office in Houston today, which is filled entirely with cartoons from the time, all of which were deeply cynical about what he was trying to do. Um, he was seen as Don Quixote, you know, sort of tilting at the windmill of Middle East peace. Um, and it was also a reminder to me that you know, this was this was about hard-nosed diplomacy. I remember he loved to use Texas expressions, which were very hard for the Arabic language interpreter in the State <laughs> Department to render into compelling Arabic. One of them was, don't make me leave a dead cat on your doorstep. <laughs> um, and, eventually, and eventually people came to understand what he meant by that, but nobody wanted to test Jim Baker uh, to lay public blame at their doorstep for making this impossible. And you remember he was, dealing with some pretty tough customers. You know, Hafez al-Assad, the bloody dictator in Syria, the father of the current bloody dictator in Syria, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, Yitzhak Shamir, the Israeli prime minister, a very stubborn and determined individual, and the always slippery Yasser Arafat. But somehow Baker corralled them. You know, it wasn't because of their enthusiasm for making peace with one another. It's because he cut off quite methodically all of their diplomatic avenues of escape. Um, and he, he really was, you know, I mean, it was physically challenging too. This is the last part of the story, but 
I remember one of his meetings with Hafez al-Assad in Damascus went on literally for nine consecutive hours. And Baker always referred to it as bladder diplomacy because <laughs> Assad, I was convinced, had a kind of surgically empowered bladder. He would sit there for hours and drink endless cups of Arabic tea, which as many of you know is the, you know, is the custom. And Baker was determined to keep up with him. So he would drink every cup of tea that got handed to him and he didn't budge either for nine hours. Our ambassador at the time, wonderful diplomat, cracked about four hours into the meeting. <laughs> and went rushing out of the room inventing an excuse about an urgent phone call. I mean, <laughs> his business was urgent, but it wasn't a phone call. So I, I say all that simply because I think, you know, what, what Baker and Bush were about was the essence of serious um, head down diplomacy. I never once, despite all the you know, diplomatic touchdowns I saw them score, because it wasn't just about the Middle East, it was the reunification of Germany, the peaceful management of the end of the Cold War. They never once danced in the end zone. And you remember the story that the you know, famous coach of the Green Bay Packers football team once told where one of his young halfbacks scored his first touchdown and got so excited, did a little dance in the end zone. And Vince Lombardi called him over and said, son, next time act like you've been there before. <laughs> Baker always acted like he'd been there before. And I think it's a lesson um, in that kind of quiet head down diplomacy. I'm guessing that the ambassador who left early ended up posted to some exciting new opportunity in Thessaloniki or something like that. What? No, he did very well, right, Jeregian, who tells that story with glee to this day. Um, one of the phrases that you referred to comes up a number of times is the idea of tending the garden and the importance of that. What does that mean and why is it important for the practice of diplomacy? I mean, I think it's important on the international landscape simply because, you know, uh, vacuums create opportunities um, for adversaries, for lots of countries to fill it um, with, you know, their own, their own efforts to expand power as well. And so, you know, over the last seven decades, it's oftentimes fallen to the United States uh, for much of that period, the, you know, the singular dominant player in the international system. Um, to help mobilize other countries to deal with that, to try to create institutions and alliances which are going to help regulate, at least to some extent, the competition for power and influence. And, you know, one of the dangers today, I think, as the United States recedes from that set of responsibilities for a whole, you know, succession of reasons, some of which have to do with, you know, disconnects between people like me and the card-carrying members of the Washington establishment and, and lots of American citizens who wonder about our capacity for disciplined leadership in the world. But when we're not playing that role, or we're not working with others to try to ensure that there are some basic rules of the road, you know, the, the garden um, tends to expand in ways that work against our interests and our values. The State Department also has its own little patch of garden to tend, which we haven't always done a wonderful job of over the years, but that's a different story. Well, you mentioned, I mean, I think when people talk about the uh, the predicament that the State Department finds itself in these days, we tend to tell that story beginning on January 20th, 2017. But one of the things that you make clear is that the muscles began to atrophy, as you put it, before that. What happened? Why did the muscles begin to atrophy? I think some of it is um, sort of natural in retrospect. You know, after the end of the Cold War, the United States really had no rivals in the international system. And so in some ways, it was natural for administrations to look for a peace dividend, to, you know, look for ways in which we could do nation building at home as a succession of presidents have, have pledged to do. Um, and, you know, that complacency, I think, um, bore a, a kind of reluctance to resource diplomacy, to, you know, sustain budgets, you know, from 1985 until 2000. The foreign affairs budget of the United States, the budget for the State Department and development assistance was cut by almost 50% gradually over that period. In the last part of the 1990s, largely because of congressional budget pressures, for about three or four years, we took in no new diplomats, no new foreign service officers. And then, of course, came 9-11, that deep shock to our system. And after that, a further emphasis on the military, on the intelligence community, and I think relatively less emphasis on diplomacy. So I, I cite those you know, realities only to highlight the fact that as much concern as I have about 
the foreign policy and the lack of commitment to diplomacy in this administration, Donald Trump didn't invent, you know, a lot of that drift. He has, however, accelerated it, and, I, and in my view, anyway, made it infinitely worse. We're going to talk again about the State Department a little later, but I, I, I do want to make sure we get um, your thoughts on a couple of hot spots. Um, one of the points you make about Russia is interesting. You said that it's a mistake to frame it as who lost Russia because it was not ours to lose and that we underplay the domestic scene. Is there a scenario by which the Russia that we encounter today, the country that is essentially on a collision course with us or with international institutions, can choose another path? So it's a really good question, and one I think not only me, but you know, lots of American diplomats have struggled with since the end of the Cold War. I mean, and I'd make several points. First, you asked the question about today. No, I think we're going to be operating within a very narrow band of possibilities with Putin's Russia, from the sharply competitive to the nastily adversarial, and that's just the reality. Um, I do think you have to take a step back, though, to understand how that came about. And I've always thought, having served in our embassy in Moscow first in the early 1990s, that you have to understand the kind of curious combination of hope and humiliation and the pure disorder of Boris Yeltsin's Russia in order to understand the smoldering aggressiveness of Vladimir Putin's Russia. Um, because Putin emerged out of a sense that, you know, along with others in the Russian political elite, that the United States had taken advantage of Russia's moment of historical weakness. Now, that's vastly exaggerated in my view. I worked in administrations, the Clinton administration, for example, in the 90s, which tried hard um, to accommodate that Russian sense of humiliation, but it wasn't easy. And Russians were never comfortable being the junior partner of the United States. And I remember in that first posting in, in Russia in the early 1990s, traveling to Chechnya during the first war between Russians and Chechens, the winter of 1994-95. And, you know, to see that was to understand that sense of humiliation, because here was the Red Army that in the Cold War was supposed to be able to get to the English Channel in 48 hours, they really looked more like a street gang than a professional military. Now, albeit a street to street gang with nuclear weapons, but um, you know they were having a really hard time suppressing in the most brutal fashion um, you know, a rebellion in an isolated part of Russia. So fast forward to Vladimir Putin, who's now been the leader of Russia for almost 20 years. Um, and you know, I, I, st I will vividly remember my first meeting as the newly arrived American ambassador with Putin um, in 2005. You have this formal ceremony known as presenting your credentials. You bring your letter from the American president to present it to the president of Russia. And of course, you do this in the Kremlin, which, as many of you know, is built on a scale that's meant to intimidate. Um, whether it's visitors or especially new ambassadors. So you come into the Kremlin, you walk through these enormous halls and long corridors, you finally come to the end of one hall. There are these two-story bronze doors, and you're kept waiting there just to let this all sink in for you. Um, and then eventually the doors crack open a little bit and out walks Vladimir Putin, who despite his bare-chested persona is not physically that imposing. He's about five, six, and he has lifts. And so, um, but he carries himself with a lot of self-assurance, um, needless to say. And so here I am, the newly intimidated American ambassador. I have my letter to hand to him. Before I could hand in the letter or get a word out of my mouth, President Putin says, you Americans need to listen more. You can't have everything your own way anymore. We can have effective relations, but not just on your terms. Now, that was vintage Putin, in my experience. Unsubtle, big chip on his shoulder, and kind of defiantly charmless. And that was the Vladimir Putin um, who, you know, who, who then, I think, you know, reacted in the only way he knew, he knew how to in Ukraine in 2014, which was aggressively. Um, and the Vladimir Putin who tried to take advantage of dysfunction in our own elections in 2016, and so chaos, and succeeded beyond his wildest imagination. I think he was as surprised as President Trump on election night about who won. But, but I say that just as backdrop to the point that while I, I firmly believe that we, we as a country ought not to give in to Putin and ought to be realistic about that, we ought not to give up on the Russia that lies beyond Putin. There's a middle class in Russia which is increasingly restive about you know, the fact that their standards of living aren't improving today. 
Um, and there's, there is a whole slew of Russians, I think, who are going to prove, you know, just as uncomfortable being China's junior partner as they were being our junior partner. So I think without being unrealistic or Pollyannish about this, as you look at over the next five or 10 years, you know, there are opportunities for artful American diplomacy with Russia. And in the meantime, establishing and maintaining some guardrails in the relationship are really important. You know, we're about to see the collapse of what's left of the old arms control architecture between the United States and Russia. And that's a very dangerous thing. You know, the, the treaty on intermediate range nuclear forces is about to fall. But I think of even greater importance is the new START agreement, which regulates strategic arms, which will expire in 2021 unless we extend it. And what I fear is that we're going to watch that last guardrail collapse. And then, you know, we have a much more combustible situation. And when we look at Russia, we have a tendency either to minimize its importance. We declared it a regional power at one point. And then, of course, we go the other way and we say, well, now it's 100 feet tall and it's meddling in our politics in ways that it clearly has. Help us calibrate our instruments a little bit. How important should Russia be in our calculus about our place? Right. I mean, as usual, as a recovering diplomat, this won't surprise you. It's somewhere in between. I mean, you know, Russia is neither 100 feet tall nor 10 feet tall. They've got a huge demographic problem. As you know, Evan, there, you know, there's only about 30 million Russians living east of the Urals. So in that vast swath of the earth, which covers Siberia and the Russian Far East, looking across a very long border at a billion for Chinese. And so there are reasons that Russians feel insecure sometimes. So, you know, it's not only that demographic weakness, it's a one dimensional economy. One of the big historic criticisms of Putin, I think, is going to be that when he was surfing on $130 a barrel oil, when I was ambassador, that was the time when he could have diversified the economy. He didn't because it would have run across his main priority, which was political control. Um, but there again, I think that leaves Russia in a relatively weaker position to compete in the 21st century. Um, but we also ought not to underestimate. I mean, I'm, President Obama, for whom I have enormous regard, did once publicly comment that Russia is just a regional power. And my response to that watching it was, well, it's a pretty goddamn big region, you know, across <laughs> – 11 time zones sitting astride Eurasia. And, you know, Putin, whatever his strategic faults, is pretty agile tactically, as he's demonstrated not just in Ukraine, but in Syria and other places. And so, you know, that's, that's why we ought not to underestimate um, the threat either. You mentioned China. And if we put Putin and Xi Jinping together for a moment, it's tempting for us to look and say, well, we see this ascendant moment for authoritarianism. Freedom House had a report recently which showed this sort of decline in democratic, consolidated de democracies around the world. And yet at the same time, you look at what's happening and it may feel as if perhaps the populist moment is peaking. Maybe we are moving past it. Can you help us gauge the health of democracy around the world right now? Well, I mean, I, unfortunately, I don't think that the populist authoritarian fever has broken yet. And I don't think the United States is, is you know, being very effective in applying Tylenol right now either, because <laughs> our, you know, our example is such today that I think in many ways we're feeding that, especially when the president kind of eggs on the bre Brexiteers um, in Britain at this very complicated moment for the British. Um, so I, I, I do you think democracy has clearly been in recession, you know, after a couple of decades after the end of the Cold War when, you know, it seemed like every current in history was running in the direction of democracy when we were in the period of globalization euphoria when American dominance seemed unquestioned. And, you know, obviously those currents have broken. I remember one of the things I mentioned in the book is a memo that I wrote for incoming Secretary of State Warren Christopher at the beginning of 1993. And, you know, there was a, a kind of triumphalist um, you know, atmosphere in Washington at the time. And we were trying to puncture, I was working for Baker in the policy planning staff in the State Department then. We tried to puncture that a little bit because already you could see glimmers, even amidst all those positive currents of challenges ahead. I mean, we pointed out that, you know, it wasn't impossible to imagine a rising authoritarian China or resurgent authoritarian Russia or Islamic authoritarianism gaining even greater ground across the Middle East. Um, and so you could already see challenges that the United States and other democratic systems were going to face. 
at its core, I think the democratic recession has been about a crisis in governance. You know, as we also pointed out in that memo, it wasn't as if democracy, you know, was going to be self-sustaining. Democracies had to deliver things for people. They had to show that, you know, democratic leaders could govern effectively. And of course, the truth is we haven't always done that. And it's our dysfunction today, whether it's in established democracies on either side of the Atlantic, and we have picked exactly the worst time to have nervous breakdowns on both sides of the Atlantic, I think. Um, but it's also much more fragile developing democracies now too that are running into these same problems of governance, which were at the core of the Arab Spring. The, it's not good news isn't the right term, but that same crisis in challenge of governance is gonna affect authoritarian systems too. As you know better than anyone ever in China, there's lots of contradictions in that system. Russia, as I mentioned before, faces huge challenges in terms of a leadership and a very autocratic leadership that can deliver things for people. And you know, you're gonna see a repetition of the Arab Spring unless Arab leaderships and Arab societies um, can meet people's basic expectations for economic opportunity and political dignity. Um, and those are just realities that you know, ought to persuade us that that authoritarian populist wave <laughs> is also not you know, inevitable and self-sustaining. They're gonna run into a lot of the same problems. I want to talk about Iran for a second. Um, some people may not know that even long before you were, you know, negotiating with Iran, you have always had an interest in trying to bend that curve, figure out a way to uh, change this relationship or absence of a relationship. If you were sitting down with an incoming president and you had an idea for how to um, reset where we are now, uh, is it possible for us to get back into this nuclear deal? Is there a deal for us to get back into? Is that not the issue? How would you advise an incoming U.S. president? Well, I mean, there. For, let me um, take a step back first, and, and then I'll, I promise I'll get to your question, because, you know, Iran is an incredibly thorny challenge since the Iranian revolution at the end of the 1970s. I took the written exam for the Foreign Service at our old embassy in London the same week as uh, our diplomats in Tehran were taken hostage. So in a way, the Iran, this sounds very self-absorbed, but in a way, the Iran issue kind of hung over, you know, my whole 35 career as, year career as a diplomat. By the way, that day didn't give you pause. You didn't think, you know, investment banking might not be so bad after. Yeah, no, it shows that my perverse ambitions at the time. No, it, it actually made me more enthused about the prospect of being a diplomat, which I never regretted. Um, occasionally, a few times, but um, <laughs> mostly not. Um, but at any rate, and then, you know, and then came the, you know, the terrible bombings at our embassy in Beirut, our marine barracks in the early 1980s by groups that were inspired and in some ways directed by Iran. You know, it was an issue that had really created a minefield in both Washington and Tehran, and nobody had a good map for the minefield. And so, you know, when I got to more senior positions in government, like in, when I came back from Moscow as ambassador in May of 2008 to work for then Secretary of State Condi Rice as the number three in the State Department, I wrote a memo that May, a couple of weeks after I had gotten there, which basically made the argument that we were missing an opportunity to turn the tables on the Iranians. We had refused to join our international partners in nuclear negotiations with the Iranians to sit at the table. And the Iranians were using this to say, we're not the problem. It's the Americans who refuse to engage. And I always thought that, you know, direct diplomacy, as complicated as, as it was with Iran, was a way both to test how serious they were, but then if it turned out they weren't capable of making the kind of compromises that would need to be made to make progress, it was not just a test, but an investment in getting other countries, even, you know, very grudging countries like Russia and China to understand that, you know, their best alternative was to join us in increasing leverage on the Iranians. And so, I mean, Iran, and we took a few steps at the end of the Bush 43 administration to open up. I was, you know, went and joined my, you know, P5 plus one, the permanent members of the Security Council plus the Germans in a session with the Iranians, and so we broke that ice. And then essentially I wrote the same memo for Hillary Clinton in January of 2009, just to show that you know, professional diplomats are capable of offering the same vice, <laughs> advice to administration after administration. But my basic argument was just as we had you know, employed the notion of containment in dealing with the Soviet Union, which meant we had no illusions about the nature of that system, but we also understood that within that 
system. There were the seeds of its own eventual collapse and a lot of contradictions too, because it's not like the theocratic regime in Tehran has answers to many of the concerns on the minds of a population that's very young, 70% of which is under the age of 30. So anyway, to fast forward then, you know, President Obama and his secretaries of state, Clinton and Kerry, um, you know, embarked on a much more ambitious approach to Iran. I led the secret talks, as Brad mentioned before, through all of 2013 with the Iranians in Oman, in Geneva, on the west side of Manhattan, where, you know, five Iranian diplomats who buttoned their shirts all the way up with no ties could blend in very easily. Um, and we produced an interim agreement, which actually a pretty good agreement. It froze their program, rolled it back, and returned for very modest um, relaxation of sanctions. And then ultimately, you know, led by President Obama and Secretary Kerry and Wendy Sherman and lots of other really fine American diplomats, a comprehensive agreement in 2015. It's a huge mistake that President Trump abandoned that agreement a year ago. Um, and, you know, I think we're, I, I, of course we can, you know, mobilize more pressure and do damage to the Iranian economy, which is already very badly mismanaged. But I don't think that we unilaterally can build enough pressure to cause that regime either to implode or capitulate, which is really what I think this is about. And I think in the process, we can do long-term damage to our own interests. We're aggravating the fissure that already exists between us and our closest European allies, in a sense, doing Putin's work for him. We're also undermining over the long term the utility of sanctions because sanctions were most effective with Iran when they were international, when we had lots of partners who agreed, however grudgingly, to squeeze the Iranians to set the stage for a serious negotiation. So, very long-winded way of getting to your question, which is, I think a lot depends on whether the nuclear agreement survives the next couple of years. I think the inclination of the Iranian regime is to try to sustain it, but they have very few economic benefits to point to right now. They oversold the nuclear agreement to their own population. And I think there are increasing risks of inadvertent collisions um, in the Middle East, whether between us and the Iranians or our friends and partners and the Iranians. Um, and that can escalate very quickly. And I don't have enormous confidence in the capacity of the current US administration to manage a fast moving crisis like that, especially with the departure of Secretary Mattis at the Pentagon and others. So. If the deal holds together, it's theoretically possible that a new administration could try to get back into it. But remember, you know, the clock will have moved by then. And so, you know, I think it'll be essential then to try to engage the Iranians seriously on what do you do to address, you know, some of the criticisms that have been raised about different aspects of the agreement. You mentioned the sort of aptitude that the government has right now. And I think a lot of us are curious to understand actually how is the State Department doing and what will it actually take to rebuild? Um, is this is this the kind of damage that's been done that takes two years to fix, 10 years to fix, a generation to fix because you lost incoming foreign service officers? Help us understand how, uh, how serious that situation is and what we might actually be able to do about it. Well, it's pretty serious in my view. Um, you know, I, I look at this as an outsider now, but it's in, an institution that I love, you know, that I invested 35 years. It's the only profession I knew um, for most of my adult life. It's filled with deeply committed, incredibly talented, patriotic people. And I think it's a genuine shame, and I mean that word um, sincerely, um, to see the way in which that kind of public service is disdained today. Um, it, it comes at a huge cost to American interests, cold-bloodedly, in the world. Um, as I said before, I do not mean to suggest that all of these problems in the State Department grew up in the last two years. I mean, you know, there are lots of individual American diplomats who are incredibly innovative and entrepreneurial, but, you know, the State Department as an institution, in my experience, is rarely accused of being too agile or too full of initiative. So we, we get in our own way sometimes. And, and if we're honest about ourselves, with ourselves, you know, there's more work that needs to be done to strip away some of the layers of bureaucracy in the State Department. That's the best way to make the argument to a White House and to a Congress, you know, that, that you need to invest in diplomacy as well. So we have to you know, help us to help them understand that in a way. 
Um, so, so I think the, the circumstances now are, are very difficult. Um, it really pains me when I talk to, you know, some of the most capable, not just senior foreign service officers, but mid-level officers and more junior officers that I know who worry, you know, about whether, you know, they can continue to serve. It pains me to talk to, to young people in college or graduate school thinking about taking the foreign service exam and wondering whether this is, you know, really the profession for them. And of course, it's easier to make the argument in some ways to young people because, you know, this isn't going to go on forever. There's going to be a moment of renewal. And, you know, they could play a fascinating role in doing that too. It's harder for those of my former colleagues who are in senior positions because, you know, they're put in the rough circumstance of having defend policies, which, you know, they understand are flawed. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we're going to open this up to questions. But before we do, I, I want to talk a bit about America's place in the world and where we go from here. You have a, um, a thoughtful line where you say, we are no longer the dominant power, but we can be the pivotal power for many years to come. Talk to us about what that means. What does it mean to be the pivotal power? Well, I mean, I mean, it's a reflection of my long-term optimism about the American role on the international landscape. It is true, in my view anyway, we're no longer the singular, singular dominant player we were right after the end of the Cold War. That wasn't going to last forever anyway. And the truth is we accelerated that moment with some of the decisions that we made, like in Iraq in 2003 or the you know, the same kind of hubris which contributed to the global financial crisis, I think, in 2008. But having said that, I still think the United States has a better hand to play than any of our rivals. It's not just because of our military strength, as important as that is. Our economy is still, I think, the biggest and the most innovative in the world today. Demography, if we could ever get immigration reform right, is or ought to be a source of strength. It sets us apart from pure competitors who are older and less mobile than we ought to be. You know, energy, not only with you know in, increased advances in clean and renewable energy, but also you know, technology, which has enabled us to export gas and uh, natural gas in ways that, you know, we couldn't have imagined 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and I would argue not least diplomacy. You know, what sets us apart, as I said before, from lonelier players like Russia and China are our alliances and our capacity to mobilize coalitions of country countries. And on this new, much more contested, much more competitive international landscape, where you know power is more diffuse among states, but it's also more diffuse in a sense beyond states with the big challenges of you know climate, which is as close to an existential challenge as any of us face today, or the revolution in technology, which is going to require countries, especially the United States, to be thoughtful about rules of the road to help maximize its benefits and minimize its downsides. Um, you know, that gives the United States, I think, a real opportunity if we play that hand wisely. And what I fear is that we're not, because we have a window before us in which we have to adapt to a different international landscape. But it's a window within which, over the next few decades, in my view, we can help shape and adapt international order in a way that's going to best sustain our interests and our values, working with lots of other countries and managing creepy adversarial relationships as well, like the US-Russia relationship. Um, but the problem is that window is not going to stay open forever. Um, and if we don't take advantage of it, that landscape is going to get shaped for us by the rise of other powers and other events. I know I told you I would open up for questions, but I lied. I have one selfishly. I'm fascinated by the question of adaptation, particularly as it relates to China. I mean, I think the struggle that a lot of us face on the question of how to accommodate China or how to deal with China or not accommodate China, China is on what matters should we permit the idea that we will be uh, superpowers that coexist? And on what matters should we say no? The global order as it exists today reflects our values and we will hold that line. I don't expect there's an easy answer, but how, how do we, how should we think about that? Well, I mean, I start from humility because I'm sitting next to the person who I think has been more thoughtful and more eloquent about China than I'll ever be. But, you know, I think, you know, there is a school of thought in Washington now, and, and you can see the, as is often the case in Washington, the pendulum moves very quickly from one end to the other, which holds that the purpose of American policy 
dealing with the single most consequential challenge we're going to face over the next few decades, which is China's rise, the purpose of American policy ought to be to contain China. I, I think that's a flawed idea. And it seems to me that the purpose of American policy ought to be not so much contain China and its rise, but shape the environment into which it rises. Um, because we have a lot of assets. You know, there's a whole web of countries and partners across Asia, from India through Southeast Asia to Northeast Asia, that share our concerns that China's rise not come at the expense of their security and their prosperity. And so we have, you know, the opportunity to build a kind of network of alliances and partnerships and institutions which in a sense are going to shape China's rise and provide a whole set of incentives and disincentives, whether it likes them or not, which are going to shape the kind of order that emerges and may even shape how it approaches some of its own domestic economic reform challenges. So having said that, I mean, I, I think the Trump administration is right to push back against predatory Chinese trade and investment practices. That's actually overdue. Um, but I think where I have serious misgivings is the way in which that's being done, because logically you'd want to make common cause with other countries, Japan, the European countries in the European Union, who share many of those concerns instead of doing what we're doing, which is starting second and third front trade conflicts with them. Um, and I also think that, you know, we, we have an opportunity also to create a kind of affirmative vision and a framework to, that reflects that. That's what the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the big new trade agreement in Asia, which the Obama administration had negotiated, which would knit together 40% of the global economy. That helps shape in a cold-blooded way you know, China's incentives and disincentives. And that's why I think it was a big mistake to throw that out the window. I mean, I've never met the perfect trade agreement or the perfect diplomatic agreement. Perfect is rarely on the diplomatic menu. But in my experience, it's better to take agreement that whatever its imperfections and then improve it over time than to ditch it altogether. Can you unretire, Bill? Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I think we uh, we have a, a microphone over here, and if you'll please go to it rather than ask from your seat, it'll mean that it'll get picked up. And if I can just make the moderator's plea, um, please ask a question rather than uh, deliver a comment or uh, an op-ed. We would be grateful. Thank you. Ambassador Burns, thank Hi. you very Hi. Thank you very much for being here today. I'm a college student here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, as I started reading your book, one thing that I was wondering is, did you ever have the opportunity to meet to meet or speak with George Kennan? You know, I, I didn't, and it's one of my regrets, both professionally and personally, that he died in Princeton in 2004, the year before I went to Moscow as ambassador, and there was certainly no more you know, illustrious American diplomatic expert on Russia than George Kennan. I also love the way he writes, too. Um, so, no, I, I never had the opportunity, sadly. Uh, I'm Sufi Lagari. Hi, Arvis. Hi. I'm Carnegie. Hi. My question is, in your back-channel diplomacy, what was the most difficult moment you think which was a very difficult uh, you would like to mention that nine trips are, but in your life, which one is the most difficult momentum of the back channel in your diplomacy? Yeah, 33 years. You no, know, it's a really good question. And most of my gray hair today comes from various back channel, you know, uh, efforts with people. And I see one of my former colleagues, John Schwartz here, who is a, a wonderful lawyer in the State Department for many years. And John and I were involved in a different back channel negotiation with the Libyans and Muammar Gaddafi. First, to get the Libyans to accept their responsibility for the terrible terrorist attack in Lockerbie, um, and then to get out of the business of terrorism and ultimately to give up their nuclear program. I never had a weirder experience in my three and a half decades as a diplomat than meeting Muammar Gaddafi, which I did three or four times. And he had this strange habit, and you know, bloodthirsty as he is, and I never 
forgot the blood that was on his hands. But he had this strange habit when you were meeting with him, especially if it was one-on-one, -on -one, just the two of you, which was a little eerie to start with, <laughs> of, of pausing kind of mid-conversation and staring up at the ceiling for three or four minutes. But he also was a um, flashy dresser, as you may have noticed. And so this one meeting he was wearing, it was like two o'clock in the morning, he was wearing what could only be described as a pajama top with photos of dead African dictators on it. So every time he would pause for three or four minutes, I would pass the time by trying to figure out how many of those dead dictators I knew. So, um, and I actually, by the end of the meeting, was doing pretty well, I think. But, so that was, that was a weirder experience in back channel. Aren't you glad you didn't wear the same top? That would have been so awkward. I had a hard time wearing pajama tops. <laughs> Syria. Yes, ma'am. What should we do now? I mean, it would be interesting to know what we should have done mm. because it could have been, people talk about the red line, and it, should have, it could have been that even if um, Obama had done a surgical strike, it wouldn't have made any difference. So what should we do now? It's such an awful situation. It is, and it's a really grim landscape, um, you know, both in terms of the human tragedy for Syrians themselves, but also the spillover effect, you know, because there's always sure. this notion that in the Middle East, the Las Vegas rule applies, you know, that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, that's rarely true in the Middle East. And so you had spillover within the Middle East, but then also in Europe, you know, which has destabilized a lot of our European allies um, as well. I think our leverage is very limited right now. Um, you, and you can point to mistakes that all of us may have made in recent years that helped produce that. Um, the Russians, you know, the Assad regime is feeling its oats right now in the most brutal way. The Russians and the Iranians um, are quite determined to maintain their position in Syria. I think what we can do, which is pretty modest, is first try to ensure against the dangers of further escalation. You know, there are real dangers right now that either Israelis and Iranian forces in Syria or Turks and Kurds or a variety of other players right. could bang into one, one another. It's not beyond the scope or imagination of diplomacy to try to build in some breaks against that. I think over the longer term, what we want to try to build is a situation in which we can use what little leverage we have. Some of it has to do with the possibility of reconstruction assistance to try to keep the door open a crack to some political openness in Syria. I'm sadly realistic that Bashar al-Assad is not planning to leave Syria unless he's carried out on a board. Um, but, but I do think it may be possible to use that leverage over time. It may be possible to drive a little bit of a wedge between the Russians and the Iranians, whose, whose interests in Syria are not perfectly identical. But I just think we have to be realistic at this stage. But even those modest goals um, are worthwhile. And meantime, we have to pay attention to the humanitarian needs of Syrian refugees, of displaced people. And that's why the huge cut proposed by the White House earlier this week in humanitarian assistance is foolish, in my view, in moral terms, but also in practical terms, too. Because if you don't address those kind of concerns, you're just sowing the seeds of insecurity and disorder, sadly, not just in Syria itself, but in lots of neighboring countries who are bearing pretty big burdens now. Thank you. Exciting to be here tonight. Hi. Um, you've uh, given some comments on uh, leaving the Iran agreement. You've made some comments about uh, leaving the short-range nuclear agreement and worry about the long-range agreement and so forth. But in all those, in both all those cases, it seems like you feel there are still there's still a role for diplomacy, U.S. diplomacy. I'm wondering about leaving the climate agreement, however. Um, is it possible for their, for American diplomacy to have any role absent any further sort of domestic policy change in the way we manage carbon? Or do you get yes. laughed out of the room if you go into uh, 
into a negotiation on climate related things no no i mean i think it's a hugely important issue i mean as i said before i think it is you know if you want to point to existential security threats the united states uh, and the rest of the globe faces that's the one i'd put at the top of the list and that's why i think it was a profound mistake to walk away from the paris climate agreement which as you know was not a perfect answer it was just the first step right so I think there's lots of room for diplomacy. I think if the United States abdicates on these issues, even though there are American states, there are American mayors, there are lots of other countries around the world who are trying, even with the U.S. out of the agreement, right. to address those concerns, I think if you don't have an American administration that's prepared to support energetic diplomacy well, to push okay. in those directions, um, you know, we're, we're operating with more than one hand behind our back, and we're encouraging other countries for whom a lot of these trade-offs and choices are difficult to abdicate themselves and you know we're all going to be the poorer and the more insecure for that so the short answer is yeah i think there's lots of space for diplomacy i'm just not optimistic that in the next year or two you're right. going to see any political willpower behind that right thanks i'd like to focus for a moment on how we move forward with Russia. I, it seems to me that their intrusion into the American um, political system is truly unprecedented and that it's essential that we somehow effectively convey to them that this is a line they cannot cross so that we can deter that kind of future misconduct. At the same time, I think it's really important that we be able to deal with Russia just as we dealt with the Soviet Union, even the worst days of that relationship, on issues like nuclear um, control and um, sort of cooling off regional conflicts. And that seems to me to be an incredibly difficult needle to thread, and I'd like your thoughts on how we can thread it. No, I mean, you've described, I think, very aptly what the challenge of diplomacy is. I mean, that's what diplomacy is all about, especially in managing relations with adversaries or rivals. It's, it's navigating the gray area between peace and war and, uh, you know, a combination of sharp differences and areas where whether we like it or not, we need to try to work together. And that's certainly true of Russia. Of course, Russia is a declining power, but you know Putin continues to demonstrate that declining powers can be at least as disruptive as rising powers. So I think the challenge is to push back firmly on issues like electoral interference. Um, I think the smartest way to do that um, is to try to work with other countries, especially in Europe, who share many of the same concerns and are also exposed. So sanctions with Russia, in my experience, are much more effective when they're not just unilateral. That's part of it. There are vulnerabilities in Putin's Russia, especially in terms of corruption and illicit finance and money parked overseas that you could exploit as well if you really wanted to deter Russia. But at the same time, I absolutely agree with you on arms control issues. It's really important for the sake of our two countries, but also the rest of the globe to manage the arsenals of what are still the only two nuclear superpowers in the world. Um, the INF Treaty, what I mentioned before, the Intermediate Nuclear Range Forces Treaty, you know, may have been on its deathbed anyway, in large part because of Russian violations. But I think it would be a huge mistake for us to abandon altogether the significance of not just talking to the Russians about these issues, but trying to develop some basic rules of the road on strategic nuclear weapons, and especially in an era in which Nuclear weapons are increasingly entangled with new cyber instruments, with advanced conventional weapons, and we're really not engaging with the Russians, let alone the Chinese right now, in any serious strategic conversation about how do you manage all of those new threats and their intersection. So we, we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, and that's not impossible. We've demonstrated to ourselves before we can do that, um, but that's what I fear we're drifting away from right now. Thank you. Ambassador Hi. Paul Richter. Uh, it's a wonderful book, wonderfully written. Thank you. Um, a question for you about uh, Afghanistan. Do you mm -hmm. think there's much hope that we can get a, a deal with the Taliban that won't start a new civil war, mark a big setback for women, 
and that will also deprive the militants of having a place to attack the U.S. from? Yeah, it's it's a really good question. I mean, I guess I'll start by saying that, you know, we're, we're almost at the end of two decades of, you know, a, a U.S. military and enga military engagement and conflict in Afghanistan. So I, I don't think we can sustain that indefinitely or much longer. I, I applaud the efforts of Zalmay Khalilzad, you know, who's the, the this administration's special envoy in engaging the Taliban to set the stage for the Afghan government and the Taliban to talk about the possibility of a political settlement. I think the missing piece right now in the diplomacy, at least as far as I can see it, is is to talk to the regional players. Now, m many of them, I used the adjective creepy before, and they, they live up to that. And there, there are leaderships that the current administration doesn't want to engage much. It's Iran, it's Russia, Pakistan, China, India, you know, countries that have a stake in what's going on in Afghanistan, a capacity to make it worse if they want to. But also, I would think an incentive in trying to ensure that insecurity in Pakistan doesn't spill over and affect their security. And, and that's the piece that I think, you know, energetic American diplomacy would want to focus on as well. So I agree with you. I mean, I think the goal here ought to be a realistic one, which is essentially to ensure that Afghanistan never again becomes a platform for the export of terrorism against the American homeland. Like you, I would love to see a set of circumstances in which the advances for women in Afghanistan, for education, in lots of other areas are preserved. And I think we should pay attention to that, but I'm just realistic about you know, the leverage that we have. And so the, the trick, the diplomatic challenge is gonna be, if we accept that we're gonna have to start winding down our military involvement, to do that in a way which at least preserves some leverage as we try to take on the negotiating challenges as well. And as I said, I do think it's important for us to deal seriously with the neighbors, because otherwise we're kidding ourselves that you know we're going to we're going to help produce an enduring settlement. Thanks. Well, this is our last question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Hi. you, Excellency. Congratulations. I haven't been called that in a while. Don't <laughs> <laughs> It'll go right to my head. It sits pretty well though. It's yeah. kind of nice. You, you, I thought he was talking to me. I'm you're sorry. excellent. <laughs> Uh, Your Excellency deserved it, and uh, uh, first, uh, congratulations on your new book. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your very wonderful introduction. I have two questions, very brief. One is about uh, sanctions. Just now you mentioned about sanctions on Iran. Uh, you know, Excellency, because uh, apart from uh, unilateral action, uh, sanction by a certain country against another country. There are many sanction regimes under United Nations. So what do you uh, evaluate the relationship between two kinds of sanctions? That is one question. Uh, second question is about China. Uh, 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 you know, there is a saying that uh, uh, right now, present uh, Chinese diplomat diplomacy become more and more aggressive. So it uh, uh, introduced very virulent of American or other countries. So what do you think about uh, uh, China's right now, nowadays China's diplomacy, diplomacy? And uh, what's your evaluation on China's present, present uh, diplomacy. Thank you. Thanks. Well, um, I'll give quick answers to both questions, which are good questions. Um, the first on sanctions, I think in my experience, sanctions are far more effective when they're international than when they're purely national or unilateral. Mm. Um, you know, the, the reason sanctions against Iran, especially in the first Obama term, were effective in mm. producing a serious Iranian player at the negotiating table mm. was because they were a combination of a a basis in Security Council and UN yeah. sanctions, and on top of that, additional US sanctions and European Union sanctions, yeah. which our international partners didn't love, but were willing to go along with. That's what had an impact. That's what focused the minds of the Iranian leadership. And the concern that I raised is by reverting to an almost exclusive dependence, in the Iran case at least, yeah. on national US sanctions, we're going to erode 
the utility of those sanctions, because already a few months ago, you had the foreign minister of Germany, one of our closest allies, standing up and saying, you know, all of us need to think about ways in which we can reduce mm -hmm. our vulnerability to the American financial system. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. but we'll wake up five or 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the dollar in the U.S. financial system will no longer have the clout that it mm -hmm. does today. Your question about Chinese diplomacy, I mean, I'm generally very impressed by the caliber of Chinese diplomats that I dealt with over the years. Mm -hmm. I think it's admirable for all my differences with different aspects of Chinese mm -hmm. policy that at a time when the United States is retreating in terms mm -hmm. of its support for diplomats and resources, China is year by year expanding. You know, I, I remember going, uh, leading the U.S. delegation to Addis Ababa, which was where the African Unity Summit was taking place. African Union Summit was taking place a few years ago. And here I was all pumped up and thought I'm the head of the American delegation. And I arrived with, you know, a dozen people from the U.S. government. Um, Hu Jintao was then the president of China. He mm -hmm. came at the head of the Chinese delegation, mm -hmm. which must have numbered 500. They don't travel light. <laughs> The Chinese had just built the gleaming new headquarters of the African Union. I know, I know. And, you know, it showed that diplomacy <laughs> properly resourced can shock and awe. Mm. We weren't shocking and awing anybody in mm. Addis Ababa that day. Mm. So, you know, I, I think it's a smart investment for a China that, you know, clearly is expanding its ambitions, not just in Asia, but around the world. Thank you. Folks, we're going to wrap up in just a second, but I wanted to tell you that uh, Bill is going to be signing books. Um, and uh, Christmas is coming, graduation gifts, um, but he will be happy to sign. And thank you all for coming tonight, and please join me in thanking Bill.